This video is sponsored by Rocketman. Keep watching or check out the link in the video description to learn more. When riding transit, usually the first thing you experience is paying your fare, often through passing through a fare gate or a turnstile, or by tapping or dropping cash into a fare box. But not all transit actually operates this way. Many systems around the world don't have fare gates or turnstiles at all, or bad looks from the operator because you forgot your fare. And as it turns out, such systems have a ton of benefits and some drawbacks. So let's talk about them. My personal quest this month is to make sure more people hit the bell icon down below. It is a very low percentage right now, so let's try to get those numbers up. Hitting the bell makes sure you get notified whenever I release a new video. People have been asking me to make a video on proof of payment fare systems for literally years, but rarely is there a specific question. So this video aims to be a general overview of some of the pluses and minuses of these fare payment systems. First of all though, what is proof of payment? A fare system exists to give riders a way of paying for transit, and to give transit agencies a way of checking that riders have paid. And before you comment it, I've already actually made a video up here about why I don't think free transit necessarily is a good idea. The long and short of it is that it's generally better to just spend that money on better transit. Now, in a proof of payment system, the way passengers prove they have paid is by having some sort of ticket or smart card which has been validated, hence the name. Rather than putting up a physical barrier or having a person check that people who pass a certain point have paid, in a proof of payment system, you present passengers with various ways to pay and expect them to pay before getting on or shortly after getting on transit. For example, in such cases where there isn't a ticket machine at the platform or stop. This could all be summed up as the honor system. To be clear, there is enforcement of fares, but this tends to be via roaming or sometimes stationary officers who check that people actually have proof that they paid. Those who don't pay will often be fined or receive some sort of strike. Now fines can actually be set at such a price that they cover the cost of enforcement as well as the cost of lost fares from people who just don't pay. Now you might be wondering, if tickets and fare cards are only checked some of the time, couldn't you always have a ticket on you and simply present it in the few cases where you actually get checked? No. This is why validation exists. If you don't have, say, a monthly or weekly pass that is valid within a certain date range that you can just show or tap in some cases, you have to validate your ticket or tap on with a fare card so that you have an active fare. Basically, if you have a ticket, this means punching in and having a little timestamp printed onto your ticket that ensures to a fare officer that you actually paid at the beginning of your trip and not just the minute before they checked you. Now, you've probably used some form of a proof of payment system on transit depending on where you live in the world. For example, virtually all tram or light rail systems use a proof of payment model. One way you could differentiate systems that are trams from systems that are light rail might actually be whether you pay on the vehicle or at the stop. Though, you know how I feel about these terms. Proof of payment actually goes well beyond trams though, as I'm sure you've realized. A lot of bus systems, especially BRT Lite, feature off-board fare payment, such as the Viva BRT network north of Toronto. Having people pay their fares before getting on the vehicle and not necessarily pay directly in front of the bus driver can speed up the time to board onto the vehicle, since you can use all of the doors. This not only means faster trips, but potentially higher frequency. This would be incredibly expensive if you had to put fare gates at every bus stop, or if you had to hire people at every bus stop to ensure that people paid. Now, in North America, if you've ever taken a subway from New York to Toronto to San Francisco, you're probably well aware of big lines of fare gates that you have to pass through when you enter the system to get to the platform. I think people often assume that this is how every subway system in the world is, because a lot of prominent international examples like London, Paris, and Tokyo also have huge lines of fare gates. But it's not actually the case. Subways that actually are based on proof of payment are not all that uncommon, especially in places like Germany where big systems like the Berlin U-Bahn actually use proof of payment, no fare gates at all. Make sure you're subscribed because there's going to be a video on that system coming up fairly soon. Now, while German subways might feel a little unusual, regional rail systems the world over use proof of payment, sometimes only at outlying stations, but often across the entire system. 
This is often because regional rail stations can be a lot less structured with a lot of entry points and making it so that they were fully secured or enclosed by fare gates is often not practical or very expensive. That said, there are places that do not skimp on the gates, Japan being one of them. From intercity to regional to subway trains in Japan, you'll see fare gates all over the place. Though there are some unusual and very cool elements to fare gates in Japan that probably warrant their own video. It's also worth pointing out that a lot of high capacity BRT systems actually do feature fare gates. In Istanbul, at least some of the tram stops also feature turnstiles, which again is something you probably have imagined could exist, but probably also assumed no city in its right mind would implement, but Istanbul does it. In fact, there are even places with turnstiles on buses. So yeah, proof of payment, definitely not a universal thing. Now let's break down some of the pros and cons of the pop model after a short message from our sponsor. Now, if you're fortunate enough to be located in a Canadian city and you're watching this channel, chances are you're taking public transit. Streetcars, buses, and maybe even subway trains. With the Canadian winter in full force, I made sure to save my local bus stop and subway station and Rocketman so that I can check when my next transit vehicle is coming before even walking out of the door. I also use Rocketman to stay informed with real-time transit delays and alerts right in the app, and I can even find out exactly where my bus is with live vehicle locations for a seamless travel experience on transit. Join me in using Rocketman today. Check out the link in the description and download Rocketman for free on both iOS and Android. The benefits of proof of payment are pretty obvious with vehicles like trams and buses, since we don't want every single person getting onto these often large vehicles to have to walk by the driver. Now, I mentioned that gates could be an additional cost for BRT or tram systems, and this is definitely the case, but as it turns out, they can actually be an even bigger cost for rapid transit systems. This is because fare gates often mean that stations need to be quite a bit bigger, especially if they're underground, and that makes stations more expensive. Large arrays of fare gates often require a big wide space, and they require space before them and after them for people to actually enter and exit from the fare gates safely. There also needs to be adequate space before the fare gates for ticket machines and the like, and circulation all over the place, which means that fare gates take up a lot of space. And since you need that space before and after the fare gates, that means that you often have to extend the length of different parts of your station. And since that space has to fit somewhere, that often means adding an additional level to a station, making it way more complicated. If you have a subway station with proof of payment and an island platform, you can literally just have stairs and elevators that go direct to the platform. No need for an intermediate level at all. At the same time, with proof of payment, it could be a lot easier to implement smart, progressive fare systems. That's because if you don't have to interface with fare gates and the like, it could be a lot easier to implement, say, an app-based form of fare payment, or social fares which could be validated in other forms. Imagine if you could just buy the fare for your local transit system on a high-quality app. This is actually really uncommon in North America, especially systems where you can buy any fare product from your phone, but this is a really good system. Better yet, you can still have a smart card. You just need to tap it on some sort of reader as you're getting on or off a vehicle or entering a station. As you might be able to tell if you've watched my videos for a long time, I've sort of changed my mind on this, as well as some other issues since I first got into the transit space. And I'm going to make a video in the future talking about some of the things that I've changed my mind on over the years. I used to think you really needed fare gates to have a proper metro system in the past, but I can see the benefits of both approaches these days. One last point worth mentioning for proof of payment systems is that data privacy is less of a concern, as we know it is increasingly becoming around the world. That's because your fare is a lot less likely to be tied to you directly, as well as the exact trips you're taking. This is a plus, but I'll also make the case that it may also be a negative. A good transit agency should be able to anonymize data from things like fare gates and smart cards to be able to do really in-depth analysis of the trips people are taking to enhance service, and this can be a lot more difficult with a proof of payment system. There are other issues too. Forgetting to pay is a real one that I've faced, especially in Toronto with Go Transit. It's not an intentional thing, obviously. It's literally forgetting. In many cases, stations put the fare payment tap points out of the way, so when you're rushing for your train, it's easy to bypass them. Some systems solve this pretty well by essentially creating a gate line of tap points, but you have to consider whether that's basically no better than just having fare gates. Another option I mentioned before is having central stations or underground stations with fare gates and outlying ones with tap points. That way it's a little harder to forget. 
Another issue you often see though with tab points is that they're difficult to place. Placing them far away from the train platform often means placing way more of them, since there are often many entrances and exits to large regional rail stations. But placing them too close to the train platform means you're gonna have giant lineups, especially if your train is even slightly big, as a bunch of people get off and all have to tap their cards. So again, it can be easy to assume that things are so simple with proof of payment, but that's not always the case. With all of that in mind, fare evasion is a real issue with proof of payment systems. Sure, people can always hop the barriers in a system with fare gates, but I think that's actually a pretty high bar and a lot of people just don't want to do that. In Vancouver, the SkyTrain system actually used to be fully proof of payment. And something that's quite interesting is that after fare gates were added, and after a few years of them sitting there unused, sitting wide open all the time, when the fare gates were finally closed, TransLink, the transit agency, discovered that they were massively underestimating how many people were riding the system and just not paying. And that money from fares could have been providing more service or other benefits to the transit system. Of course, fundamentally, transit systems should make it easy for riders to do the right thing by giving people a variety of ways to pay their fare. Like Vancouver, allowing you to tap through the fare gates with your debit or credit card, something which almost everyone is just going to have in their pocket. Of course, you should also implement strong social fare systems so that those who can't afford to pay don't have to worry about it. At the same time, you need to design your infrastructure so doing the right thing and paying isn't a complete hassle. For example, in Go Transit's case, by providing tap points that are obvious and not easy to miss. And in systems like Montreal's case, providing more ticket machines at every station. Seriously, it's crazy. Every time I go to Montreal, I get into the metro and you'll have this gigantic station with like one or maybe two fare machines and a long lineup of people. That's not good. Now, to be clear, we also still have to learn from places all around the world. As I mentioned before, Japan has a ton of interesting ideas about fare payment, but often with really smart and thoughtful designs that we wouldn't imagine in North America. Why should we think so much about fare systems? Because they are one of the places where people actually interface and interact with transit. And removing pain points helps make transit a better option for everyone. Thanks for watching.